Hello and welcome to chapter 9, the lymphatic system for pathology. <clears throat> so we're going to do a little lymphatic system review. And remember, this is a one-way system composed of lymph, lymphatic vessels, lymphocytes, lymphatic vessels and tissues, lymph nodes, organs, and glands. All right, lymphoid tissue is found in red bone marrow, the thymus gland, the spleen, and mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, otherwise known as malt, um, such as tonsils and pear patches. The lymphatic system helps to maintain fluid balance. It transports nutrients throughout the body and metabolic wastes, and it has disease-fighting functions. One of the functions of the lymphatic system is to collect excess interstitial fluid and move it to blood circulation. This process adjusts blood volume and pressure and prevents swelling, otherwise known as edema, in the um, limbs of the body. Okay, so this green thing here is the lymphatic capillary. They are larger in diameter than blood capillaries. The walls of the lymph capillaries are attached to surrounding tissue with anchoring filaments. The walls of these capillaries overlap, creating a flap, and this is sort of a gated entryway for interstitial fluid to come in. It sort of comes in the gates, and when it comes in, it's like a trap door, and it cannot get back out. When pressure is greater inside of the capillary, the flap compresses, and lymph cannot move back into the interstitial fluid. Conversely, when pressure is greater outside the lymphatic capillary, the anchoring filaments pull on the capillary wall, and then that flap opens, that gate opens up, allowing fluid to enter into the lymphatic capillary again. Similar to veins, larger lymphatic vessels have valves that open in only one direction, and this guides the transport of all of the lymphatic fluids towards the cardiovascular system. Okay, so the lymphatic capillaries move lymphatic fluid into larger vessels, which all have lymph nodes situated at key points along their path, all right? You're also going to hear me say capillary or capillaries or capillary or capilla capillaries, capillaries. It depends on where you live, potato, potato, which when you say you're going to hear both, as you work in hospitals, chiropractic settings, um, wherever you may be other than possibly uh, a spa or a salon type uh, situation. And even then you might hear someone talking about their blood vessels. They might say capillary, they might say capillary. So just get used to potato, potato. All right, lymph nodes contain lymphatic tissue that destroys pathogens and filters waste. I'm gonna say this again because it's super important. Your lymph nodes contain lymphatic tissue that destroys pathogens and filters wastes. The superficial lymph nodes are found in massive numbers in the groin called inguinal nodes, in the armpit called axillary nodes or axillary nodes, and in the neck called cervical nodes. So how do you think the lymph moves throughout your body? It's not like the blood where the heart is assisting in the movement of fluids. So how does lymph move? Lymph moves through pressure from both internal and external uh, forces. Internal pressure comes from smooth muscle units within the lymphatic vessel walls called lymphangians and they contract to move lymph from one section to the next, sort of like peristalsis in the digestive system, all right? External pressure exerted on vessel walls can come from skeletal muscle contractions, pressure changes in the thorax and abdomen during breathing, you know, that diaphragm is yanking down and it's creating um, the act of inspiration, the pull of the skin and fascia during movement, 
Um, and one really cool thing to notate here in terms of movement, the lower lymph in your body, the main pump for that is actually going up and down on your toes with the act of walking or climbing with your legs um, to keep that in mind. So if someone is complaining about some lower leg swelling or they sit all day in a chair, they could do some toe raise exercises every time they get up to sort of pump up and down on the balls of their foot, stand on their toes, drop back down, and do this several times. And that actually activates the pump. Very often you will see ladies that wear high heels or anyone that wears high heels start to complain about some fluid buildup in the legs. They are not moving their heels up and down in a regular gait pattern the way that those wearing flat shoes or walking barefoot uh, do naturally just by the movement of walking. High heels prevent that heel from dropping down as you walk and it limits that lymphatic pump uh, in the lower leg itself. So now we know how it moves. There's a couple of other functions that you should know about. So the function of the lymphatic system is to transport dietary proteins. Of course, it also gets rid of waste, but it also transports lipids and lipid sol soluble vitamins like A, D, E, and K from the digestive tract to the blood. But the lipids and the lipid soluble vitamins are too large to be transported by blood capillaries or capillaries. Remember, words are hard, potato, potato. Instead, they are transported by specialized lymphatic capillaries called lacteals, located in the small intestine. Another function of the lymphatic system is to carry out immune responses. Immunity is a complex reaction that involves all the body systems as they sort of join together to destroy and eliminate pathogens, foreign substances, and toxic materials. Occasionally called the immune system, immunity is not actually an organ system, but rather a functional system that draws on structures and processes of multiple organs, tissues, and cells, as well as the chemicals produced by them to protect the body. The two major mechanisms of immunity are nonspecific and specific. Nonspecific immunity is also called innate immunity, and it provides a general immune response to a wide variety of harmful organisms. Okay, so if pathogens per penetrate the first line of defense, the lymphatic system becomes activated. This process is known as specific immunity. It's also called adaptive immunity immunity. These responses recognize specific pathogens and respond by launching an attack against them should they reappear. The primary cells that are involved are specialized lymphocytes called T cells and B cells pictured here uh, from your textbook. And specific immunity can either be acquired naturally as a result of simple exposure to a pathogen or artificially as a result of introducing substances into the body to stimulate an immune response such as vaccines. Specific immune responses develop quickly, but not as quickly as non-specific responses as the latter is already in place and can attack the threat when presented. In something like an autoimmune disease, the T cells and B cells are unable to distinguish the body's own tissues from something that is foreign to the body. Those cells then attack the body's tissues themselves. For instance, in rheumatoid arthritis, an immune response is triggered and attacks the synovial lining of joints. In multiple sclerosis, the immune response attacks the myelin sheath around neurons in the central nervous system. In type 1 diabetes, the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas are attacked and destroyed by immune responses. There's even a type of mushroom that is so close to human cells that when you eat it, the body will create an autoimmune response and start to attack the body. All right, so now we're going to talk about aging the lymphatic system and overall immunity. So the main effect of aging on the lymphatic system is a reduction in the amount of body fluids, uh, in particular, your intracellular fluids. 
Plasma and extracellular volume remain somewhat constant, but the intra, inside your cells, intracellular fluid decreases, which increases the risk of dehydration in the elderly. Inactivity, as well as a decline in kidney function and cardiovascular function, increase the risk of edema, which is swelling in the limbs, especially in the lower extremities, such as the legs. The immune response is slower and weaker in the elderly, and this increases the risk of many diseases, including autoimmune diseases, influenza, shingles, and cancer. Okay, so this is pathology. So we're going to talk about lymphatic and immune pathologies. Pathologies are for this chapter are divided into conditions of the lymphatic system and conditions of immunity separately. So some general manifestations of the lymphatic system and immunologic system diseases are things like skin discoloration, like pallor, redness, jaundice, cyanosis, unexplained bruising or extra skin pigmentation or loss of skin pigmentation, the presence of rashes, hives, scaliness with or without itching, enlarged lymph nodes, swelling, limbs that are unequal in temperature, history of chronic fatigue, failure to gain or maintain weight, exercise intolerance, and unexplained weight loss. Because the lymphatic system is involved in inflammatory and cardiovascular disorders, as well as cancer, disorders limited to the lymphatic system are pretty few. I mean, the ones included in this section are lymphedema, edema, lymphangitis, and large lymph nodes, um, and Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we're going to go over each of those in detail. So lymphedema and edema are conditions that involve swelling, but they have very different causes. Lymphedema is swelling caused by abnormal accumulation of fluids within interstitial spaces because lymphatic vessels or nodes are malformed, damaged, or have been surgically removed, okay? Malformed, damaged, or surgically removed lymphatic vessels cause lymphedema. It's classified as either primary or secondary, all right? Cellulitis, which we have talked about before, we have spoken about, is a localized bacterial infection of the skin and underlying tissues, and that is a complication of lymphedema, but it is not a lymphatic system disease itself. It is a complication of lymphedema. Edema is swelling caused by an imbalance in the distribution of body fluids but unlike lymphedema, the lymphatic vessels are still intact. There's a lot of really important terms that are used when describing lymphedema and edema. Generalized edema occurs throughout the entire body and is common with people who are severely ill. Localized edema is limited to the site of trauma, such as a sprained ankle, a specific organ, such as a pulmonary edema, or a specific area such as edema of the abdomen. Swelling is usually not detectable until interstitial fluid volume is 30% above normal. And with regard to localized edema, several other terms are also used. You can say peripheral edema to describe edema of an extremity, like the leg, the lower limb. A type of peripheral edema called dependent edema is used to describe swelling in gravity-dependent areas of the body, such as the legs and feet. Angioedema is a type of edema seen in allergic reactions, and this involves the deeper tissues of the skin. Edema can be pitting or non-pitting. Pitting edema leaves a depression or a pit in the skin for several minutes after firm pressure is applied and released. Non-pitting edema does not leave a dent after the skin is compressed and released. This image is of non-pitting edema resulting from repeated strains of the left ankle. Edema is something that can be treated by massage, but let's start with lymphedema. Lymphedema should 
only be treated by massage therapists with specialized training and skills in manual lymphatic drainage techniques. And lymphedema management can work affected areas. So you really need to get your certifications, get those extra workshops and seminars and credits and training in lymphatic drainage. There's a lot that goes into this. I have a couple of courses and books under my belt myself for lymphatic drainage. I am certified in lymphatic drainage. And honestly, my books used for that uh, look like my college chemistry books. Um, it's pretty involved stuff. And you can really hurt someone um, and damage the flow of lymph if you're not careful with doing this work. Now, if you do get certified, these techniques reduce excess limb volume and skin thickness of the arms, um, you know, other extremities that are, that are affected. And manual lymphatic drainage techniques improve the quality of life, um, such as reducing sleep disturbances, breathing difficulties, and overall pain. Um, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, PNF, techniques reduce lymph lymphedema in upper extremities. Um, but the group that uses PNF in this particular study that your book cites, um, they showed a great decline in swelling. The American Cancer Society recommends manual lymphatic drainage for those experiencing lymphedema after breast cancer. If you are not trained in lymphedema management, avoid areas affected by lymphedema, please. This includes not only areas where lymph nodes have been surgically removed or damaged, but also areas distal to those sites because inappropriate pressure may cause or increase swelling. For example, if lymph nodes were removed in the left axillary region in the left armpit, do not massage the left arm, left forearm, or left hand. Massage therapists who want to specialize in oncology massage often also become certified in manual lymphatic drainage techniques because of the prevalence in lymphedema in cancer patients who undergo certain types of cancer treatments. All right. <clears throat> now, some sy systemic symptoms such as fever or malaise can develop. Um, if you see signs and symptoms of cellulitis in an effective limb, cellulitis, it's our fever red stoplight, you do not massage cellulitis and urge your client to seek medical attention immediately. Reminder, if left untreated, cellulitis may spread rapidly and become life-threatening. In cases of edema rather than lymphedema, you can place the affected area on cushions to raise it above the level of the heart. Um, with your clients that have extremely high blood pressure, if they have edema, like in both feet, uh, you need to inquire about that before you raise both limbs above the heart level, please. Um, we don't want to increase pressure there. Uh, but elevation helps promote dependent drainage or drainage from a higher area to a lower area under the influence of gravity. You're going to use light, perpendicular, and parallel pressure and stretching of the skin to open up the lymph capillaries, allowing interstitial fluid to enter the lymph capillaries. Be sure the pressure is gradually moving in the direction of lymphatic flow. All right, lymphatic flow is pictured here. In the upper extremities, lymph moves towards the armpit, and in the lower extremities, towards the groin. The main uh, pump is in the inguinal region that everything is pointing to, sort of like the underwear line if you were wearing bikini underwear. Um, that is where the main inguinal uh, lymph nodes are located. You also have some underneath your clavicle. Um, there is a lymphatic pump um, massage that you can do to your clients. It's pretty cool. You cannot do it to yourself because of the way the muscle activates in that position. Um, but if you're interested in seeing that, maybe I'll record that massage technique and upload it for you. It's very interesting. But again, you can do very light, gradual direction of pressure um, with manual lymphatic drainage techniques only, only for 
dependent edema or trauma related edema in your clients, not for lymphedema. One last notation about edema or swelling before we move on, and that is swelling and heat application. If a client has localized or generalized swelling, the use of all heat and all forms of thermotherapy are contraindicated because it can increase swelling. All right, so here we go on to our first pathology. Lymphagitis. Lymphagitis is an infection or inflammation of lymphatic vessels. It is most often a complication of a bacterial infection, indicating that a primary infection is spreading. Lymphagitis is also called angioleukitis. All right. <clears throat> Lymphagitis is a condition requiring immediate medical attention. This is a fever red stoplight. It is a contraindication. Massage is absolutely postponed until the condition has completely resolved. Next up is enlarged lymph nodes. Enlarged lymph nodes or lymphaendopathy. Lymphaendopathy occur with the invasion of disease-causing agents. Lymphadenitis is the term used to denote infection within the lymph nodes themselves. The affected nodes are usually found near the site of underlying infection or origin of a disease. In generalized forms, lymph node involvement is widespread throughout the entire body. <clears throat> this image is a man with leukemia with resultant enlarged lymph nodes. You can see them in the inguinal region and also in the neck especially. Okay, <clears throat> so what's going on when we have enlarged lymph nodes? Some of the signs and symptoms are you can see them in the cervical axillary or inguinal area. Bilateral involvement might be no noted, <clears throat> so it's not just one side. Both sides will generally um, get inflamed, and when you palpate them, the lymph nodes will feel hard, similar to a black-eyed pea underneath the skin. The skin over a lymph node might be red or hot, and the limb distal to the affected area might have edema in it. Depending on the underlying cause, you can also have um, symptoms of systemic infection like chills, fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, and headaches. So <clears throat> what about enlarged lymph nodes and massage? You can palpate them just beneath the skin and superficial to muscle. When palpated, like we said, they feel dense and hard and similar to the shape of a, a raw black-eyed pea. A normal, non-enlarged lymph node should feel soft and mobile, very pliable. Superficial lymph nodes are found in great numbers, called inguinal nodes in the armpit. They're called axillary nodes, axillary nodes, words are hard, potato, potato, and in the neck called cervical nodes. Enlarged lymph nodes are a local contraindication unless you have received specialized training and skills and manual lymphatic drainage techniques. Next up, we have Hodgkin lymphoma. Um, this was discovered by Thomas Hodgkin, British, uh, British physician, um, who died in 1866. So we've known about Hodgkin lymphoma for quite a while. It is a cancer of the lymph nodes. It initially involves a single lymph, no lymph node, usually in the neck, and then it progresses to adjacent lymph nodes in an orderly fashion. It involves organs such as the spleen and liver, as well as bone marrow. While you can massage um, people with Hodgkin lymphoma, you need to ask your client about current signs and symptoms, as well as side effects of cancer treatments. Um, the Lymphoma Association supports the use of massage using light pressure only. Light pressure only and limiting the session length to 20 or 30 minutes at a maximum. It has been found that massage reduced cortisol levels in people with um, hematologic cancers, such as lymphomas, who are undergoing chemotherapy. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is a cancer of the lymph nodes as well. <clears throat> the clinical picture is similar to that of Hodgkin lymphoma, 
except for non-Hodgkin lymphoma, is initially more widespread. It doesn't start with a single lymph node. It has multiple node involvement, and it has unorganized metastasis in the early stages. So Hodgkin lymphoma, we have a very systematic growth pattern starting from a single lymph node spreading outward. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is more chaotic and just attacks willy-nilly and spreads. <clears throat> Now, with massage therapy and non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the same protocols um, are in place. So you need to ask about current signs and symptoms, as well as side effects of cancer treatments, light pressure only, and limit the session length to 20 or 30 minutes for these clients. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to start talking about conditions of immunity rather than the lymphatic system specifically. Okay, so immune disorders are usually a malfunction of the immune response, and they may generate fever, hypersensitivity, such as allergies, autoimmune diseases, or immunodeficiency disorders. Um, so we're going to discuss things like allergies, chronic fatigue syndrome, SLE, multiple myeloma, and AIDS in this. Um, mononucleosis is discussed in Chapter 10, and scleroderma is discussed in Chapter 4. Um, <clears throat> just so you're aware of those where they lie, but they also are conditions of immunity. Now, our first one is fever. Fever is a rise in body temperature indicated by an oral temperature of more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius. Um, normal temperature ranges from 98 to 100 Fahrenheit, and fever is noted mostly during infections, chronic and systemic inflammatory processes, and autoimmune diseases such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. Fever is also called pyrexia. This is probably an emblex question. When you hear pyrexia, they're talking about fever. P-Y-R-E-X-I-A, pyrexia is fever. When you massage someone with a fever, guys, we call it the fever red stoplight for a reason. Um, to prevent the spread of possible infection, massage should be postponed until your client has been fever free for at least 24 hours without the use of fever reducing drugs such as ibuprofen or acetaminophen. Next up is allergies, which are altered immunologic responses to otherwise harmless substances. You know, the trees are out there happy. They're pollinating so hard. And you get your allergies, seasonal allergies. The term allergy originally denoted both aspects of the immune response, immunity and hypersensitivity. Now the term allergy is used to denote only the harmful immune response and immunity talks about the protective effects of the immune system. Allergies are also referenced, this is an emblex question, allergies are also referenced as hypersensitivity reactions. Hypersensitivities are divided into four basic types, um, type one through type four. <clears throat> Most healthcare people use the term allergy to indicate type 1 hypersensitivities, and that's all we're going to talk about right here. Um, there is a table in your book that shows all hypersensitivities. It is table 9.1 in your book. All right. The most perilous type of type 1 sensitivity reaction is anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is a severe, acute, life-threatening allergic reaction. Um, it involves things like choking, wheezing, shortness of breath, and they can occur within minutes of exposure, all right? That usually happens um, with insect stings, ingesting nuts or shellfish or something else that you're severely allergic to, or a drug reaction. Um, that's another uh, fun gambit in the game of ph pharmaceutical medications. You can suddenly have anaphylaxis. It is the least common allergic reaction, but it's the most serious and can lead to anaphylactic shock and then death. <clears throat> now, if you're going to massage someone with allergies, figure out if they have any environmental product or food allergens, ask about past reactions to allergens. If they have a severe allergic reaction to things, ask if they're carrying an epinephrine auto injector like an EpiPen 
and where it's located. Ask about latex allergies, wool allergies, detergent allergies, uh, allergies, products containing shea butter, lanolin. Um, <clears throat> latex allergies have been linked to allergic reactions to shea butter because of cross reactivity. So that's something cool to know. If you have someone with a latex allergy, you may not be able to use your shea butter products. You may only be able to use water-based hypoallergenic products in the massage treatment. All right. <clears throat> Moving on to chronic fatigue syndrome, which is characterized by prolonged and severe tiredness and disabling fatigue. The feeling is not relieved by rest and might worsen with physical or mental activity. Chronic fatigue syndrome affects approximately 500,000 people in the United States, mostly women between the ages of 30 and 50. Before diagnosis is made, the client reports a 50% decrease in activities of daily living for at least six months and has had at least four of the more than 60 symptoms published by the CDC. Another diagnostic criterion is that the fatigue does not have any identifiable cause. CFS is also caused, Im, called immune dysfunction syndrome. Now, when it comes to massage therapy and chronic fatigue syndrome, because the client's symptoms vary daily, you need to ask your client about their current symptoms and adjust the massage accordingly. It's also helpful to ask how the client responded to previous massage, making appropriate treatment modifications, which may include changes in technique pressure and speed or changes in the session duration. If they feel dizzy or lightheaded while sitting up or standing after the massage, it might be related to orthostatic hypotension or a sudden drop in blood pressure, which might last up to three minutes. So ask them to sit back down and remain seated until the feeling of dizziness has subsided. Massage therapy has been shown to reduce depression, anxiety, and pain among those diagnosed with CFS, and these effects were noted immediately and continue to decrease over the five-week treatment period along with reducing other CFS-related symptoms such as emotional distress, persistent fatigue, and sleep disturbances. Now we are on to systemic lupus erythematosus. Systemic lupus erythematosus, or simply called lupus, is a chronic autoimmune inflammatory disease of the body's connective tissues. It commonly affects the skin, bones, joints, the nervous system, kidneys, lungs, and other organs. It's a whole party of awful. Blood and blood vessels are often involved, leading to Raynaud disease and reduced levels of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Lupus is the most common autoimmune disease with periods of remission and exacerbation, which is typical with most autoimmune diseases. It might appear suddenly or take years to develop. Um, as of 2016, there were at least 1.4 million people in the United States that were affected, um, and it's higher in women than in men, and it usually occurs between the ages of 20 and 40. One of the most common signs is a rash developing on the face, spreading from one cheek across the nose to the other cheek. This is called a butterfly rash or a malar rash. Similar rashes do appear on other usually sun-exposed parts of the body. You can also have fever, enlarged lymph nodes, and extreme fatigue might be notated here. Massage is contraindicated during periods of exacerbation or if fever or if any other new symptoms or, or signs develop. The situation requires medical evaluation by the client's health care provider. Now, during periods of remission, a very gentle full body massage is indicated, avoiding areas with active rash. Because the client's symptoms vary daily, you need to ask the client about his or her current symptoms and adjust the massage accordingly. It is also helpful to ask how the client responded to the previous massage, making appropriate treatment modifications, which could include changes in technique, pressure, and speed, or changes in session duration. Be sure to address any coexisting medical conditions like anemia and Raynaud disease in the treatment plan as well. 
Next up is multiple myeloma. This means many folded and it is a malignant disease of plasma cells. These cells originate in bone marrow, are part of the immune response, and are involved in the production of antibodies. The disease is called multiple myeloma because it occurs in multiple bone marrow sites in the body. Most people are at least 45 years old before they are diagnosed, and the disease affects more men than women. It's believed to begin from the mutation of a single plasma cell, and clonal expansion of this one mutant descendant leads to their overgrowth in bone marrow, which eventually erodes all affected bones. Not only is antibody production affected, but blood cell production is reduced. Multiple tumors develop in the skull, vertebrae, ribs, and pelvis with associated bone destruction. A person with multiple myeloma is often treated for conditions such as arthritis before the correct diagnosis of multiple myeloma is established. You can massage those with multiple myeloma, but you need to ask your client about current signs and symptoms, as well as side effects of cancer treatments. All right, um, chemotherapy is the primary treatment for multiple myeloma, as well as radiation therapy and bone marrow transplants are also used. Blood transfusions may also be required during later stages of the disease, so be aware of all of the complications associated with those. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is next, and human immunodeficiency virus infection. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, is a viral infection characterized by progressive impairment of the immune response and increased susceptibility to infections and cancerous tumors. The person is considered human immunodeficiency virus positive, HIV positive, when blood tests positive for the virus antibodies, even if the person has a few, if any, symptoms. The same person has AIDS versus HIV when the immune response has weakened to the point at which he or she has had at least three opportunistic infections or a T-cell blood count below 200 cells normal range um, is between 600 and 1,000 cells per microliter. So if you have dropped down to less than a third of your T-cell blood count, you are considered to have full-blown AIDS. Age is the final stage, which is stage four of an HIV infection. And the average time from viral exposure to the development of AIDS is just over one decade. So 10 years um, from the beginning of HIV to full-on AIDS. AIDS as of right now is an incurable disease, a combination of drugs termed highly active antiretroviral therapy is used to reduce the replication of the virus, which continues for the lifetime of the individual. A variety of treatment options are used to minimize the effects of the viral infection, such as antidiarrheals and surgery for the removal of tumors. Counseling is also recommended to address psychological needs of the infected person. Now, with massage therapy and HIV and AIDS, there are a couple of things to be aware of. Um, not only is it actually um, transmissible, um, you can get it by swapping fluids. And while sexual contact with an infected person is the primary means of transmissions, um, you can also do it with the blood I know that uh, people are warned um, often about saliva, but really it's, um, it's transmitted mostly through sexual contact and blood. So if your client is bleeding, has an open scab, things of that nature, you need to be aware of this. You can absolutely massage people that have AIDS or HIV, but please do be careful of bodily fluids. It cannot be transmitted by simple contact with an infected person. Intact skin 
is adequate protection from the virus. So if they have no scabbing, they have no open skin, and you're massaging them, there's not going to be any issue of transmission. If they do have a cut, if you have a cut, if you both have a cut especially, and you have um, an opening where blood or plasma can seep out, then absolutely uh, please do something such as disposable gloves. Now there's been some pretty cool studies um, in terms of massage and HIV. Infants born to HIV-infected mothers um, scored in the superior range when given the neonatal behavioral assessment scale when they were massaged compared to non-massaged infants. The infants who were massaged also experienced greater daily weight gain. Um, massage, again, decreases anxiety and depression and enhances immune functions among HIV-infected adolescents. Natural killer um, NK cell levels and their cytotoxic capacity increases in HIV infected patients after receiving daily massages. And those same individuals also had decreased anxiety and increased relaxation. Um, when massaging a client who has an HIV infection or AIDS, you need to determine their level of vitality. Um, if they are frail, they might require some modifications. Inquire about areas that need to be avoided, um, including lesions and large lymph nodes and the most recent site of any blood work that was done. Avoid using aggressively applied passive stretches and joint movements if they've been inactive for prolonged periods because of the possibility of reduced bone integrity. All right. Another... Um, Study that I have seen is that it will increase um, T cells as well, killer T cells, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I learned about that one almost 20 years ago um, and was involved in a volunteer organization uh, working with sex workers and drug addicts in uh, various areas of Florida, and they were doing a blood study of increased killer T cells in those that were massaged with HIV and AIDS. One final note, um, it's true in any instance of body fluids on surfaces, treat them as contaminated, not only for HIV and AIDS patients, but any patient because people are gross. Sanitation and cleanliness are important elements of treatment for the client and the therapist. Um, because the immune response of the HIV-infected client or clients with AIDS is not fully functional, they are more susceptible to contracting infections through exposure from you. You are a greater health hazard to your client who has HIV or AIDS than what they are to you as a therapist. If you have an infection such as a cold, you need to reschedule the massage for your client's benefit. You should anyway for any of your clients, but when you have immunocompromised patients or clients coming into your office, you are under obligation to make sure to the best of your knowledge that you are not ill and compromising that patient's safety.